and then I would say this. I think more than whether I had a personal relationship with Governor Milliken, uh, ideologically, we were pretty much on the same page on about everything. I mean, if anything, I was probably more liberal than he was, if you can believe that. I, everybody nowadays thinks of... As a conservative uh, Republican. Uh, well, <laughs> they, well, no, I mean, they think nowadays Milliken is being almost a communist if you're a Republican. And I'm saying he was looking, you know, conservative and right-wing compared to me on a lot of issues. He really was. What was your last appointed position before you went into publication of Inside Michigan well, Politics? Well, after uh, we get through licensing and regulation, so I quit that to run for the U.S. Senate to start walking through Michigan, and we've covered that. So when the race is over, now what happened in the race? In the primary, Rupi won the primary. He was a former congressman. Uh, he had a lot of uh, build up support and sympathy for him because four years before he'd wanted to run and he kind of got stabbed in the back. And so he won. I was second. Huber was third and Baker was fourth. But, you know, uh, close doesn't count. You got to win the nomination. So Rupi had the honor of challenging uh, or being the Republican nominee against Don Regal in November. And uh, he got smoked. Uh, it was a terrible year for the Republicans. The Republicans lost everything in 1982. Um, and so I probably was just as well that I lost the primary, although I argue that I probably would have run a more interesting race against Regal. I might have gone off on another walk. I don't know what I would have done, but I would have caused some excitement. Let's put it that way. Maybe you would have started in Ironwood this time since I it was have, August. I could have done that. I could have, you know, I missed part of the state. I'm going to go back and cover it. But anyway, the point was after that, what? It literally about a month went by, and Governor Milliken appointed me state racing commissioner, horse racing commissioner. Now, honestly, today people say, what? Was there such a thing? Uh, there was such a thing, and at one time it was a very uh, coveted post. Uh, Michigan was the third state in the country in 1933 to legalize paramutual horse racing. Uh, at one time, remember, the only way you could gamble in Michigan legally was horse racing. There was no lottery. There were no casinos. There wasn't any other way that you could legally gamble other than at the racetrack. Did you have a background in racing? I mean, why did Milliken none. pick you for that? None. Absolutely did, none. Had you ever bet on ponies before? Or? No. None. I, I came from a family where my mother and two sisters liked dressage. Uh, you know, show jumping on horses. They had horses, but they weren't race trackers. They weren't touts. They weren't rail birds. But again, I always had followed horse racing. Uh, I'd always, you know, Milliken didn't ask me, do you know anything about horse racing? He never said anything. I think he thought, you know, Ballinger didn't really screw up too badly when he was director of licensing and regulation. I might trust him with another appointment, even if he doesn't know anything about the subject. And he does know the legislature, and, you know, he knows state government, so yeah, I'll put him in there and let's see how he does. Well, I loved it. In fact, I almost think of all the jobs in politics I ever had, including the legislature, including in Washington, State Racing Commissioner was my favorite job. And let me tell you, when you were State Racing Commissioner, Michigan is the only state in the country with a single commissioner. And it's a full-time salaried position. You're a czar. And in fact, I call myself today the czar. When I, called, when I talked to these people that I dealt with 40 years ago in racing, uh, I, I sign off as a czar, and they say czar. They, they refer to me as czar. That's what they call me. They don't call me commissioner, senator, director, anything else. They call me czar. And Michigan was the only state that had that. The rest of the states all had multi-member commissioners that were part-time, boring stuff. They'd point an executive director. In Michigan, you were everything. And I did a lot of promotion for horse racing, and I actually you know, improve the situation marginally, but let's face it, horse racing was already dying in Michigan because the lottery had already been in place for a dozen years and the casinos started to kick off about that time. Uh, you had the Indian casinos and then in 1996, 
uh, you got the three Detroit casinos on the ballot and they passed. And ever since then, it was down, down, down. And finally, you get to the 21st century, and Jennifer Granholm issued an executive order in which she really deep-sixed uh, the Office of Racing Commissioner and folded it into the state gaming board, uh, and, and which I think is a, an abomination. And I think it could be challenged in court. But the point is, even if you resurrected a Racing Commissioner, what would he be able to do today? hardly anything. We're down to like one track. It's like I, Northville, that's it, right? Yeah, I, I had seven tracks. Seven tracks. I I licensed three new tracks while I was commissioner. I came in with four. I licensed three more. And they're all gone except one, Northville. That's it. Your transition between racing commissioner and giving up your crown as czar right. to later take that up... That was painful. I'm sure it was. <laughs> to then later take up your pen and typewriter and later computer to ultimately regain the title of Crown Prince of Pundits yeah. by the late Charlie Kane. Yeah. How did that transition go from horse racing yeah, that's... back to writing and doing it the old-fashioned way, mailing it? Yeah, no, that, that is a really good question. And actually, there's a connection. What I started, as soon as I was done being racing commissioner, I went to the sports editor of the Free Press, and I said, you know what, I want to start writing a racing column for you every week. So for six years, Kyle, I wrote a horse racing column. I've got it all. I, I, I can once show, a week? Once a week, I wrote a horse racing column about Michigan horse racing, what was going on at the tracks, harness racing, state, you know, thoroughbred racing, the whole shooting match. And I did this for six years, but it was, you know, it was a part-time thing. I'm writing one column a week. You know how much you write today uh, is so much, uh, so voluminous compared to the piddly little effort I was making. But all during that time, I was thinking, how can I capitalize on an idea that I've had for a long time? And that is start some kind of a subscription, uh, very short, brief, newsletter, political newsletter, uh, like existed in some other states. There's one in Tennessee, which I still think not only was the best then, it's still the best, called the Tennessee Journal. And you may know what it is. You may know the editor, Brad Forrester, has been the guy who's been the head of it. Um, and I decided, okay, I'm going to start um, a weekly new, uh, bi-weekly newsletter. I decided I'm going to make it once every two weeks. I started in March of 1987. So I was still writing a racing column, and I wrote it, I think, until like 19, yeah, I'm, I'm saying maybe 91. And then I stopped it, and I went full-time with Inside Michigan Politics. That was the name of the newsletter. And I started out very modestly, um, charging $125 a year, and just tried to build the uh, circulation up. And it was a, a paid subscription newsletter. So that was, that was the transition. So what was your idea behind Inside Michigan Politics? What did you hope to share yeah. with people? And, and what was kind of the universe of people you were yeah. trying to sell the newsletter well, to? Well, remember, at the time, you had Gongwer and you had MERS, Michigan Information Research Service. Uh, Gongwer was going pretty strong. Both of those had been founded during the Constitutional Con uh, Convention. Uh, Gongwer had already existed previously in Ohio. And uh, MERS was started up by uh, a local lobbyist who was a pretty strong uh, figure in Lansing at one time. But it had kind of fallen on hard times and wasn't doing very well by uh, the late 80s. And uh, until the Roarings and Steve Linder bought it in the mid-90s, it was floundering. And then they've turned it around, and now you're here, and things are really firing on all cylinders. That's another story. But my point was, I always felt, when I was in the legislature and when I was in state government, that the Capitol Press Corps that covered the legislature didn't understand what the hell was going on back at the grassroots, at the local level, in the various districts. They didn't know. And people at the local level uh, who could cover their local state senator or representative 
they didn't totally understand everything that was happening in Lansing other than what they'd read in a wire service or something like that. And I thought, you know what? I can bridge the gap. I can uh, come up with something that's going to make people think a little more about the absolutely inextricably bound together connection between what's going on in Lansing and what's going on at the grassroots in the various districts. Also, picking up on what Susan just mentioned about horse racing, I'm going to start picking winners. I'm going to handicap. Like, you know, you go to the racetrack and some guy comes up to you with his car and says, hey, buddy, you know, here's the, who's going to win the seventh race? I got it right here. You know, that kind of stuff. So start picking races and actually start picking judicial races, not just legislative races or whatever, but judicial races. Never been done before. So I started doing that and I made fearless calls, many of them dead wrong, but so what? I was doing it, and I was actually getting them right a pretty high percentage of the time. So I figured, you know, people would like something like that. I'm not going to try and be MERS or Gongwer and do a daily compilation of bills and bill analysis and what's being reported. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going there. This is going to be a simple little four-page newsletter put out every two weeks but it's going to have all sorts of spicy stuff in it. I had quotes. I did a lot. I started doing the lobbyist survey where I, uh, I actually did a poll survey where I sent out questionnaires all over state government and got people to say who's the greatest lobbyist, who's terrible. And, and they would put quotes, and I would print the quotes in the newsletter. And some of them were scabrous, and they were terrible. And people that. were furious uh, at some of the stuff was in there. It had never been done before. But a lot of people said, hey, you know what? These lobbyists are making a hell of a lot of money. And who the hell is holding their feet to the fire? You know, isn't it right that public can comment on this? So I did that. So I did a lot of kind of breakthrough first ever things in the newsletter. And my idea was just to see if I can get enough people. And you say, who was my audience? It was like everybody. Uh, it, well, I mean, it was anybody who had any interest in state government or in Michigan politics. Obviously, that could be legislators. It won, it's for several years, I had the entire Senate Democratic Caucus subscribe to my newsletter. I had a lot of legislators, a lot of lobbyists. I had trade association executives, uh, unions, uh, I had uh, PACs, political action committees. You must have had a huge staff. Uh, me. That was it. And I never had bylines, never had bylines. Um, what I, and I wrote it all myself, or sometimes I had people write stuff for me, or people would volunteer to write stuff for me, and very often, they would want to give me stuff to write, which they were too gutless to publish <laughs> over their own byline, or they didn't want anybody to know who it was. And so I would rewrite it, and I'd package it. So, I mean, the whole idea was for people to look at the newsletter, and it was a seamless you know, kind of series of stories with no byline, and you just had to either accept or reject what was in front of you. And it wasn't attributable to anybody. Uh, and in fact, at one time, uh, I took to interviewing myself. Uh, people used oh, to. Oh yes, I yeah. People this. used to say, "Well, this is ridiculous. Uh, you're, you're interviewing yourself." I said, "Who could ask me better questions than me?" And so I'm going to interview myself, and I'd put that in there. So anyway, it worked, and so it was very successful. So what I'm really interested in here, Bill, is that after you had already been in politics for so many years, and you had already been kind of uh, labeled as a moderate Republican, and then you get into journalism, one of the dangers that happens when you jump fields like that is that you're already labeled as something. In right. this case, people already knew you as a Republican. So how hard was it to get inside Michigan politics out there and be seen as a straight shooter, somebody who yeah. was nonpartisan, when you had been a partisan for so many years? That was a major challenge from the very beginning. And it always, I'm not going to say haunted me, but it always was hovering over me as a major uh, hurdle that I had to surmount um, because I wanted to be seen as objective and nonpartisan, even though I had this very partisan past. But remember, I said that I made a lot of my reputation uh, writing the newsletter as a handicapper. 
picking races. Uh, now, you can't be a partisan and be a handicap with any objectivity and success, it seems to me, simultaneously, people are going to get very suspicious. They're going to say, are you kidding me? Ballinger, the Republican, is picking races. Uh, he's going to, you know, skew things the Republicans' way every time. So, I mean, I picked a lot of races uh, where, you know, I'd pick a Democrat to be a Republican. Uh, and I think I build up a reputation, Susan knows this, over time, where a lot of people would come up to me and, uh, or they'd come up to Susan or they'd come up to other people and they'd say, what are you really? I mean, what, what, <laughs> what do you really believe? I right. mean, what's your background? I mean, you gotta remember a lot of people didn't have the great history in politics or government that I did and other people did and they didn't know. They just knew the stuff I was putting out and, and I, that of course made me burst my buttons with pride like I, by God, I've done it, you know. I, they're convinced that I'm objective and I'm nonpartisan. So, yeah, it was always a challenge. I think the fact that I was, as you have observed, a so-called Millican moderate or a liberal Republican or whatever you want to say, made it easier for me to be accepted by Democrats and independents as being pretty much down the middle. Uh, I wasn't some flame-throwing right-winger uh, either in the past or when I was doing the newsletter. And they can see that. It was pretty obvious.